Let's continue our winter school. And now I want to introduce the next speaker, the teacher of uh, the winter school who's been present for the past 10 years here, Alexei um, Lobanov, head of bank regulation in the Bank of Russia. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. Good morning, everyone. I hope that uh, the tea has given strength to those who turned up late, uh, having missed the most interesting part. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me for the 10th time. This is my 10th winter school and 14th school as such including the summer schools. And when I was thinking what this school is for me, what significance it has, uh, remembering the old good times, Apart from this being a good opportunity to come to Perm, the city which I like a lot in all seasons, in winter and the summer, especially after the adventures that I had here in the summer with the people I had met in the winter school, it's an opportunity to work during the night before my presentation, it's um, an opportunity to understand something new. It's not just to be ahead of something. And it's an opportunity for me to meet new people, new ideas that I hear and um, that I wouldn't meet anywhere else other than here. And our organizer, Elena Mechinkova, uh, shared a picture with Richard Olsen, their first meeting at one of the winter schools. I decided that I should also share a picture of the kind. Can you see Richard in this picture? Um, but still he's there. The unknown photographer I made a picture at the very first school when I'm showing Vladimir Filimonov this website of uh, Olsen Associates website, uh, which he didn't know about uh, by then. And I told him where he could find the uh, information on the prices on all the markets. And at the time, I was also working at a financial market. I found, about, found out about uh, this company and its founder, and I shared this information with my new acquaintance, Vladimir. So it's not just giving a presentation that gives new knowledge, but uh, the informal Communication also gives you a lot when you exchange ideas and discuss what you have just heard. And after the school, uh, we continued talking to one another. Today, I want to talk about the topic which surprises me, to be honest. Um, this is something uh, you can get surprised not only by the things that you hear from others, but uh, also you can be surprised by the place where you are. And in a strange way, nine years after my first uh, visit to the Perm Winter School, which was de um, <coughs> devoted to r market risk regulation, nine years later, I am still discussing regulation, but of crypto assets. Uh, this transition is interesting uh, for two reasons. As today, 
Uh, firstly, as today Sergei said, uh, this concept did not exist by then. Uh, such uh, such uh, terms as crypto assets or crypto economy. And the second surprise is uh, the fact that uh, two years ago, um, it's a panel discussion, we were discussing the main approaches and ideas to regulating this new uh, sphere of crypto assets. And then we were emphasizing the transaction, the regulation of transaction and instruments, uh, emitting those instruments. And we were not speaking about regulating the ownership of, of such assets if they are in a um, bank um, portfolio. And uh, today we will be talking about this. And the third part of my surprise is that only two years ago, uh, we could think in very general terms and trying to collect some ideas that could be could lay the basis of the future regulation and we were not even sure that such a regulation was important or necessary as a universal international approach or recommendations uh, we were not sure when such standards should be introduced and whether they should be done simultaneously in different countries or just in one country, one jurisdiction. There were lots of questions we raised and we didn't get any clear answers even in, in our discussion. But today's talk is an example of how quickly the time passes. Yesterday Richard said about, uh, it was talking about the time passing quickly, how it is uh, inhomogeneous for different um, market players. And in, it's uh, an example of time acceleration. Bank regulators even ha didn't have the concept of crypto assets in their vocabulary. And only two years uh, later, we have I already a second document on it. And maybe uh, together we can find um, an answer to the questions uh, raised by the um, international community. It's not the bank community uh, because the, uh, this, uh, ba the commentaries are welcome from a whole wide range of uh, actors and stakeholders um, like um, and it doesn't happen very often that uh, Basel committee should address uh, should ask uh, s such a wide range of uh, stakeholders to give their comments. The concept of crypto asset means that this is an asset for somebody, for somebody who has um, purchased it and um, thinks that it is a certain deposit and subjected to certain risks, uh, some of, of which should be regulated. And we will talk about this, how the Basel Committee sees it. This is a very good time for it. This document I will be talking about um, was issued in December and uh, the time for comments is up until March and um, uh, then maybe we can send some of our comments to the ba Basel committee. So what are we going to talk about today um, uh, about what has been done over the past year by the Basel committee? about this quite new sphere of crypto economy and crypto assets. Uh, it's firstly about the bank regulation. It's not the markets and not uh, issuers of crypto assets and um, some other aspects uh, to do with their uh, trade and investment, but it is about the risks um, taken over by the banks on the um, where they are purchasing something, uh, depositing something and deploying their capitals, uh, their own and other people's. Then we, I want to touch upon the um, to start to give a start for the discussion that we are going to have uh, later. Um, we, where we are going to try and answer a few questions uh, raised in directly by the Basel Committee and uh, they are waiting for our answers till the middle of March. For this, 
I will remind you of the main characteristics of crypto assets that Basel Committee thinks uh, significant for further regulation, because the main, the most um, difficult thing is not to design the regulations, but to define the range or the sp the limits of regulations. How uh, this is one of the most complicated um, problems. Uh, so that this fear should not be too wide and to take in um, things that should not be regulated or it should not be too narrow. We are also going to talk about the risks as the Basel Committee sees it, uh, all kinds of risks connected with um, operations in crypto assets, uh, not only um, in the active part of uh, the balance sheet but also the <coughs> the operations on <coughs> um, issuing their own crypto assets as uh, financial instruments or operations with crypto assets in the interests of bank clients. And we will look at the way um, we now, we currently see the future regulatory mode for the banks, f for the banks for which all Basel documents are written for. These are the banks that work in actively in international markets where the, there, should, there is the issue of compatibility of risk assessment and um, other aspects. Basel Committee says that other banks could do, could have the same regulation if the country is ready to accept it. So this is a kind of image of the future. It may not be a very um, accurate image of the future, it may change. I will show you an example of uh, how the, um, uh, of, uh, as how there are complicated co problems hiding uh, behind a very simple thing. And so what consequences can follow? I will show you such uh, one of the hot points and uh, even if the objective seems very simple there is no simple solution for this and then finally we will come to the Q&A session um, I will try to highlight um, them for you so that uh, you can give it a thought and uh, during my presentation, you may come up with ideas and comments that you can um, <coughs> tell us at the end of our panel. Um, I cannot go over all those questions, but not all of them are equally interesting. The aim is uh, for this document, as um, the, uh, all other documents, and is for uh, colleagues uh, to uh, to be heard and uh, our ideas are, have been heard for example in the Basel uh, uh, committee has uh, quoted some of our comments and they have led them to taking the decision on what banks should be subject to regulation um, and so I hope that uh, the, this discussion will be fruitful if we can uh, tra um, transfer the, our ideas to the authors of the Basel Committee document. And uh, also the Russian community could give a response uh, to this. Uh, to these proposals that we come up with today. So let's start. Where are we now in terms of maturity of uh, regulation? Speaking about other types of assets and risks connected with them, uh, crypto assets are a radically new object for study and Basel Committee acknowledges that and uh, they say that the first uh, objective is to monitor the trends taking place at present. So it does not 
insist on introducing regulation right now. It is not setting any <coughs> deadlines. And um, <coughs> of course, a lot of work uh, is ahead of us. Now we are only connecting data. Uh, data collection is one of the uh, most difficult exercises that Basel Committee does every half a year and sometimes more often. On the risk assessment, they have uh, different uh, <coughs> templates for that. They collect the data, discuss it, and um, the, uh, they make, uh, analyze it and make the decisions as to whether it is necessary to adjust regulation. Now they are not talking about adjusting the regulation, but what they need uh, only they need to understand the scale of the problem, and they're trying to outline. You know, as an artist, uh, before actually painting something, they make an outline, make the contours of the future. Uh, picture and only then do they take the paints and brushes and now we are at the stage of making a sketch and it doesn't mean that this sketch uh, will remain unchanged I will start by saying uh, by reminding you or even asking you uh, who of you have read a short document that was issued uh, by Basel committee in the form of news a news uh, a bulletin in March last year it was devoted to uh, crypto assets. I will put up my hand because I had to do with this text before it was published. And uh, I saw the final wording was different from the first version. But this is one page that will be quoted by the historian of financial regulation as the first step in the long way of de designing international regulation of bank activities in the sphere of bank assets. Uh, what was this document about? If you have time, you can go to the website of the Basel Committee and um, you can choose FinTech rubric there and uh, there, it, there it is. In this document, which was published in March last year, uh, less than a year ago, just after the last year's school, winter school, Uh, this document said that uh, the Basel Committee acknowledges the existence of crypto econo economy and crypto markets and financial instruments uh, representing this new reality that potentially they can uh, present a um, threat to financial stability, uh, which gives, um, sets the basis for further regulation. Although the scale of the threat clear by now and that they have some um, features that were acknowledged as obvious to uh, necessary to start this work two of these features were named they spoke mainly about uh, cryptocurrencies they are not the instruments that have the standard set of money attributes and they are not a legal means of payment. This was a fact, and that they were not a safe media of exchange or investment due to inherent risks. Two words, exchange and the store of value. So they acknowledge the fact that these assets are risky as an exchange means and as a store of value. What risks did the Basel Committee see? They are enumerated here. And um, you see the set is well known. They, it lists pr practically all the known bank uh, risks, uh, liquidity, 
different liquidity uh, balance and uh, markets, credit risk, market risk, operational risks, including the new uh, cyber risk, the money laundering and terrorist financing risk, which is not new for the bank sector, as well as legal and reputational risks. The names are not new, but the content um, is not not the same as what the banks used to have for the past 20 to 30 years of their work. Uh, speaking of um, the legal uh, risks uh, during transactions with crypto assets, uh, we were speaking about that last year, if you remember. In that letter, or announcement made by the Basel Committee, they proposed a response to those potential risks and threats to financial stability. They asked the banks to wake up uh, to the future dangers, to do an <coughs> analysis of all uh, risks, not to involve in operations with crypto assets if the bank does not believe that they have enough exper technical expertise for that. But if they do get involved in such transactions and operations, uh, they should make uh, it uh, assess the due diligence pro as a necessary component of uh, risk management. And uh, they should involve the top management and the board of the bank and into this work. And they should assign the people who will be responsible for, for, the, for these operations. And there is also um, um, requirement to disclosure in, to disclose information to publish at the bank website uh, and provide open access to this the the deposits and their operations uh, with the crypto assets and also uh, set the supervisor aware of the operations that they plan in advance or at least that the bank is interested in, in getting involved in such operations. Uh, unlike um, other bank operations, it is necessary to tell the supervisor of the bank's interest in um, using crypto assets. I remember a letter that I received from a bank that does not exist today. So I'm not going to mention the name. It was okay at the time. It didn't lose a license, but it left the market in a different way. In a legal way. The board of directors asked me, the market of cryptocurrencies is growing, the revenues are high. Is it okay to invest the money of the bank into Bitcoin? And he had a number of definite questions, how to include it into their accounting books, into contracts, uh, how to take, uh, how to calculate the capitals and assets. And we gave him a very definite answer that these assets are not part of the legal reality. And we cannot answer any of the questions he asked but we suggested, suggested him to think about the risks of uh, handling those operations using the money of the lenders. So this is the uh, example for the last point. And now the main topic for my speech today is the document uh, called uh, Discussion publication, which is uh, not a typical type of text for Basel Committee. It is not only uh, designed for the banks, but also for a wider audience. It was published in December 2019. 
and comments are accepted until March 13, 2020, so we have about one and a half months to react to the document. This is the link where you can download the document. It's rather short and easy to read, and it doesn't contain any vague ideas, uh, formulas, uh, or links, or references, which happens a lot. It's a very independent document, and it gives a clear idea of uh, this area, which uh, Basel Committee is focusing on. The uh, comments are welcome from the following, from the following parties. So everyone who wants may comment, and this is not very typical because a lot of publications from the Basel Committee are uh, aimed at uh, experts, banks and regulators, uh, so sometimes scientists, but and associations that represent the representatives of market participants. In this document, you will find 15 questions. Actually, there are more questions, because some questions include uh, several sentences, interrogative sentences. So one question may include a few questions. You don't have to leave comments for all of them, and some of them are of minor importance. There are interesting questions, and I would like to talk about them and invite you to discuss the questions during panel discussion. So if you would like to react, you can do that privately by sending your comments to Basel Committee. I think there will be a lot of responses and it will take a long time to process all the comments and probably by the end of 2020 or the beginning of 2021 we will get some feedback. So the the, the, I will give you an overview of this document to save your time and attention and to uh, focus on the most important areas and probably awaken your interest for our discussion. It is very interesting to be part of a process that is just starting because you can use a, a little effort to impact the development a lot. So the first question uh, asked by the Basel Committee, and I think this is the most valuable question, is the event to analyze the properties of uh, crypto assets for the purpose of future regulation. This is not a scientific analysis and an attempt to look at crypto assets through different factors and lenses, but that is an attempt to think of the properties that will unite cryptocurrencies, a wide range of cryptocurrencies. Here you can see some names uh, taken from the report. And uh, also there are different certifi certificates, tokens, so on and other crypto assets that may be circulated but Basel committee tries to draw a line between crypto assets and uh, crypto tools electronic tools uh, that are already familiar in the market there are three properties defined by Basel committee and the question is whether these three properties are enough. The first one is digital and virtual nature. They are issued, transferred, and traded electronically only, without any paper, cash. Of course, we understand that this is not the only feature of crypto assets. And a lot of securities and financial tools are also digital. That is not new. The new thing is uh, reliance on cryptography and uh, various methods are used to do that. And the Basel Committee just mentions a few approaches how 
cryptocurrencies and assets can be protected. So these transactions are stored in a distributed ledger, which can be both open for all new participants or closed and designed for a certain audience or a number of users and may serve their specific needs. Also, several times in this document, they mentioned that some crypto assets uh, may have higher risks and they may not be a requirement for a certain issuer like it happens with the securities, bonds and other, uh, other economic tools. So they don't have a specific issuer or a custodian. And uh, and uh, they try to draw a line between the existing electronic or uh, like uh, yeah, electronic tools, financial tools that are paperless and uh, crypto tools. And the question I would like to ask first during our discussion is whether the, these uh, features are complete and correct or perhaps we should ask uh, add something uh, to this description to be able to regulate the crypto assets properly. And perhaps we include some existing electronic assets into the description of crypto assets. Now, talking about the properties, we have to look deeper. So that was kind of a superficial review that is obvious to all the participants of the crypto market. So the properties are quite obvious. But if we look deeper and try to understand what is similar for different crypto assets in terms of their economic nature, Basel Committee makes also quite a superficial analysis, but tries to uh, define the functions of crypto assets, such as payments and exchanges, investment and securities, and, you, and a new and a new function, utility access. Access to certain goods or services which is not directly expressed in uh, monetary value. So that's just a utility function. And uh, sources of value of uh, crypto assets Fundamental, fundamental value, although uh, Basel Committee doesn't use the exact wording, they try to understand why a purely uh, uh, virtual tool that does not exist anywhere except than a record in a ledger, in a distributed ledger, why does it have certain value and attraction? for the participants of the market. The first one is uh, expectation of the opportunity to exchange it for other goods and services in the future. So uh, the re Basel Committee draws a line between uh, instruments that have internal value or not. And according to the Basel Committee, crypto assets do not have any internal value. Uh, which is a very controversial question because uh, in, our in one of our previous schools we discussed the value, the internal value of crypto assets and uh, we heard a report about that. Another factor of value is um, uh, the uh, circulation rules uh, in terms of price stabilization mechanisms this topic was also discussed in the previous school. We talked about stable points that are definitely 
accepted by Basel Committee as a certain type of crypto assets. Also, uh, expectation of uh, like current or future cash flows, and also certain technological features that increase the value due to certain limitations in emission or access to the market or circulation or ability to add a lot of new participants to the market who want to trade this asset. For example, we can, uh, we can compare it to the uh, limited editions or issuance of uh, uh, coins and if they are limited they have higher value so a similar thing can be implemented through technological features of crypto assets. The next question we are going to talk about, I hope you will have your opinion on it, are there other potential sources of value that are relevant uh, for the crypto assets. So I have an idea in my mind uh, so I decided to have a discussion with you. I think there are some extra factors of value. By the way, the number of the question in my presentation is uh, the same as it is uh, in the document of Basel Committee. So if you look at the number of the question, it will be the same as Basel Committee gave it. Also in its report, Bas Basel Committee mentions a few other additional aspects that may affect the risk profile of crypto assets. First of all, they draw a line between uh, uh, crypto assets created by an issuer or unsecured crypto assets. And they suggest to regulate risks connected with these two classes of crypto assets in different ways. Then in terms of users, it can be general public or a defined user base that use a certain network where crypto assets circulate. The next principle is validator, uh, validators. Uh, they can be private ledgers that are accepted to the market without any special permission or mm, a public ledger. Legal regime in this country where crypto assets are regulated and transactions are regulated. And the final point is transparency, uh, price discovery, timely availability, capitalization, valuation of crypto assets, and uh, other features of securities and derivatives that we normally discuss are also mentioned for crypto assets and whether they are actually relevant for crypto assets. A lot of emphasis is uh, made on audit, especially for crypto assets uh, secured, unsecured by some collateral or whatever. So then Basel Committee uh, discusses a very interesting thing, analysis, an attempt to look at the bank from all possible sides in terms of uh, assets, liabilities, uh, so that to be able to see where risks may come from, not necessarily financial risks, but also reputational risks that banks may incur without any financial losses. But for example, if clients of the bank lose their money due to fraud or certain events in the market, and I tried to classify 
all the risks. So here you can see my classification. It's not given in the document of Basel Committee. I decided to unite them based on uh, different uh, types of risks or exposures. So the first one is issuing and uh, underwriting tokens uh, or other financial assets that the bank issues itself. I'm not talking about any particular country that is just a vision that I have, uh, supposing that the banks may deal with any crypto assets. What kind of exposures may it have as a result? So that's direct issuing of crypto assets by the bank, like it happens today with bonds and securities. The next one is underwriting ICO from other participants of the market, issuers of cryptocurrencies. That's kind of an investment function. And underwriting SFT with crypto assets, for example, Rebo uh, transactions or some other operations where crypto assets are part of the transaction structure. In addition to raising funds, the main risk of the bank that the bank can accept is also owing crypto assets. It can be direct owing if the bank buys uh, crypto assets in its own interest or uh, it may also buy products based on crypto assets. For example, uh, um, stock exchange uh, fund that invests into crypto assets. Of course, it's possible to trade crypto assets so in the interest of the bank or in the interest of the client. And then the bank will be the broker of the client. Uh, of course, lending is a key function of the bank. And uh, when it comes to crypto assets, we carry some market risk. It's interesting to analyze risks connected with lending. The first one is lending for investing in crypto assets. In this way, the bank takes on the credit risk connected with the market risk or other risks connected with crypto assets bought by the uh, creditor. Also, a bank may take crypto assets as collateral and uh, become a collateral lender. And if something goes wrong, crypto assets will stay with the bank. And uh, there are liquidity risks and market investment risks in this case. The bank may also lend to entities dealing with crypto assets, for example, stock exchanges, rating organizations, or companies that provide professional services like consulting or technology services for the participants of the crypto asset market. That is called indirect investment and indirect risk acceptance. And the next one is lending, direct lending in crypto assets. So if the bank owes, owns them, they, the bank may sell it, lend it. Of course, if, it is, if this type of lending is allowed in the country. And uh, in addition, the bank may be a depository that stores crypto assets in the interests of the client and uh, makes certain transactions. Uh, so it can uh, transfer crypto assets from the issuer to the owner and so on. Also, it can take deposits in crypto assets if the market is so attractive and maybe it will have um, lenders and depositors. But I think it's a long-term perspective, but perhaps not so long. 
And uh, besides, it can accept collateral for the issued um, crypto assets. So the bank will be a de depository custodian by means of uh, storing this collateral. And the function is to provide for a collateral for crypto assets. It can also do clearing operations in the uh, derivatives market, like futures, and also in countries where it is allowed to combine insuring, insurance and banking. It can insure against theft or loss of uh, crypto assets due to technical problems or other reasons. And um, an important, the most important function of the bank is exchange. So, uh, of course, the exchange of crypto assets for fiat currencies and fiat currencies for crypto assets is another uh, source for the bank to get exposed. This is an interesting analysis. I think it's rather full. When I was reading this document and studying this document, I think this list is complete. However, we may know some other channels of exposure for the banks, uh, maybe some unexpected channels that should be discussed. Or perhaps we will make a decision that this analysis is full and we can use this scheme in the future. An interesting uh, question to talk about is uh, how uh, do these exposure channels vary by different types of crypto assets? Uh, because crypto assets may be different like cryptocurrencies, tokens, other similar tools. Will the risks be the same or different for the bank? So Basel Committee is only planning to research this area. And uh, uh, talking about uh, the operations with cryptocurrencies based on the bank exposure profile that we have spoken about already. So here you can see uh, very familiar categories. I will start from the left top corner, that's liquidity risk, which may in exist both in the crypto asset market or in the bank itself. Uh, if the bank doesn't have enough crypto assets to pay for its uh, liabilities. Another is uh, a risk connected with volatility and pricing. If there are several uh, places where the same crypto market is traded, the pricing can be different. How uh, can we reevaluate these assets for the bank and for the client? Uh, the next one is third party risk. If there is a third party, we may claim uh, certain, we may have certain claims for the third party. Um, and uh, this includes the risks connected with uh, the problem of defining the price of the credit because we don't have enough historical data in this market. And of course, when I think about it, the first idea that comes to mind is operational risks connected with the direct loss of crypto assets due to cyber attacks, forks, operational reliability of the network that carries out the operational transactions. The next uh, group is reputational risks because it's, a ver it's very important. The bank doesn't have any assets protected by patents or licenses. So uh, only ideas, trading ideas, commercial ideas that can generate revenue unless other companies copy them. And reputation, 
is something that connects the bank with its clients and makes bank assets very sensitive to the situation in the bank unlike securities uh, that are not influenced by the owner. There are a lot of different things that may cast a shadow on the reputation of the bank, lead to uh, the customers, clients running away and reduce the business of the bank. Also, there are legal risks that include uh, consumer protection, also safeguarding crypto assets. Um, the next one is uh, complications connected with uh, uh, preventing laundering and combating terrorist financing. And uh, the problem that exists in more traditional markets, but maybe to a lesser extent, is cross-border legal issues. I think this may be a very serious risk. So this uh, risk profile looks complete and it kind of matches the previous slide, but the question is whether we have any extra risks or combinations of risks that are not typical for traditional banking operations and are only uh, only exist for the crypto assets, both on the uh, assets and liabilities parts of the balance sheet. I think a very interesting uh, point of my report is uh, about prudential treatment. Before starting on designing new regulation, we should make sure that we have certain principles that uh, should be uh, um, used until we complete the design of this regulation. The first principle is the fairness principle. And um, if um, this risk of uh, crypto assets is the same as uh, risk um, of other types of assets, the regulation of this type of asset should be the same. For example, it is the market risk connected with the ownership of crypto assets. The volatility can be very high and there can be problems with the source of uh, value. But we can also s still say that potentially crypto assets can be included in the general scheme of uh, bank assets. And um, they postulate neutrality. And, um, we should neither encourage the use of a certain technology nor um, discourage uh, using them. It should be neutral in terms of uh, technological nature of these assets. Although it is rather difficult to adhere to this principle uh, because uh, we have just postulated the dependence of the value of the assets on the technological solutions in the protocols or the market architecture. And uh, if we can pass um, this um, edge of the razor, it's um, arguable. The, re the next principle is simplicity. Regulation should be simple. Uh, w w they, um, this principle appeared seven years ago when they started, then they started to develop Basel III. Uh, what um, came out of it, you know very well. And we understood how far um, we are from the principle of simplicity and compatibility of a session. In particular, they say that um, the complicated uh, risk calculation models will not be used. There should be a single, um, simple and uh, conservative mode that can be used by any bank from a large one to a small one. And uh, another thing that should be pointed out that um, 
we should make a subclass of high-risk operations, um, which should uh, be especially rigidly regulated, while all others can have more flexible regulation system. And as I mentioned, uh, countries um, can do what they like. They can either apply very strict regulation or they can ban some operations on some of the assets and digital instruments. But if they do use those future um, international standards, they should at least provide for the adherence to those standards. So these are the three principles. And whether they are enough, and uh, that's a question. And how, to what extent these principles uh, can be followed, it's another question. And we should add something specific for crypto eco economy to them. One or two other principles uh, which would uh, mark the difference of these uh, kind of assets um, from all other kinds of assets. As an example, Basel Committee uh, gives a kind of um, a sketch or a blue pay, blueprint uh, version of regulation. Um, those are the assets that follow all four um, features. These are the assets that are stored as distributed ledger and are crypt cryptographically protected. So this is the major characteristic of all crypto assets to differentiate them from other assets. These instruments are acknowledged as um, highly high risk, and they cannot be issued by a specific issuer. So you cannot complain to your counter agent in your transaction or to the issuer of an instrument. These instruments are not uh, provided in, for in any way, and they are not connected with any real assets that have real value. And um, now they um, use the paradigm of the absence of internal in or inherent uh, value to these assets. And also, the ownership of this asset may not lead to the appearance of uh, rights and obligations between the holder of this asset, for example, a bank uh, who acted as a broker for their client, and some specific um, uh, entity that has issued this asset. Uh, these are the four things. I think it is a very interesting question for the practice, whether these criteria are enough, sufficient for differentiating between these types of assets for all others, um, to which the regulation should be less specific. What do they suggest we do in terms of such high-risk assets? These are the approaches that are understandable for those who work in banks and uh, work with the risk assessment. The uh, complete coverage of the whole sum of um, investment in the crypto asset by the most active part of the capital. This, is, this works when we use uh, with the assets that are on the balance sheet of the company. Uh, such as um, obligations or loans that the bank holds until they are settled. But what if it is a trade instrument that is um, intended for hedging uh, or for short-term speculation or uh, the instrument that the holder has no intention of holding to the very end? Uh, for example, to support their own liquidity. So if you bought them for that the so-called treasury portfolio. They postulate the mode equivalent uh, to uh, the d subtraction. It is because it is difficult to provide for this equivalence. And it will mean uh, that there will be high, um, in high rate uh, um, the non-acknowledgement of any effects of diversification of these type of assets. 
such as commodity contracts or securities or money, monetary instruments. If these instruments have an optional component, then for them there will be an additional risk connection uh, connected with the option uh, constituent and um, this risk will be subject to capital coverage uh, which is a re remaining risk and it says that how uh, this risk will be calculated by taking 50 percent by thinking that it is half of its uh, value of this basis asset, uh, which is at the basis of this asset. And another additional sum taken from the new regulation, even after you have um, taken into account all netting, and margin elements. The crypto assets will not be acknowledged as a permissible collateral for any calculations diminishing credit risk. So if you uh, are given such uh, assets as collateral, you cannot use them to diminish the sum of uh, credit risk. And ex um, in th now I'm going to tell you about the discussion which in which I took part. And there are several options that are possible. And these uh, options are, are alternative. And the combinations that can uh, take place are very different. You can deduce from the capital, but it's not clear how. Uh, you can use it conservatively, uh, conservatively as a commodity asset, uh, thinking that it is another kind of commodity that a bank can uh, buy along with uh, um, up orange juice futures. Uh, it can be made a separate uh, class of assets. And then the question arises, what um, risk ratio should be used with it? and. The, th the first three were addressed to the banks that use the new approach to risk regulation. And the, two, uh, the last two are for those banks that uh, use the old type of regulation. And the questions are the same, either deduction from capital or simplified treatment without deduction from capital. And what does it mean to deduce from capital the and we can deduce long positions, but what do we do with short positions that have, um, uh, and if we deduce those, it will mean that two minuses will give us a plus. The log economic logic is lost here. So here they try to say that only long positions will be deduced from the capital and the short ones, the plus positions, that have uh, option risks will be calculated separately in the general uh, risk as, uh, market risk assessment. So it uh, happens so that we uh, break the possible internal hedging in the portfolio. The short positions will be calculated separately. This is a bad thing. Maybe we should calculate it on the mo the position of the all long positions and short positions and deduce the total from the capital in, um, irrespective of the its sign. There is no uh, solution, it's just a discussion. If we look at the coverage of market risk without deduction, what will it mean? There will be a number 12 basket in the calculation of commodity risk with all the ensuing uh, difficulties with um, the scaling of uh, the risk, even if we don't take into account any factors within this basket and other commodity instrument baskets. And so the cal calibrating the risk uh, co ratios is a difficult task. The same goes about the making a, 
assets, crypto assets, a separate, a separate asset. And and uh, what I mentioned at the beginning, the Basel Committee calls for the bank to include these risks in their internal procedures and even disclose them according to existing standards. Basel Committee acknowledges the existence of um, quite a different reality, saying that there are crypto assets that are meant to serve a spe specific market, for example, interbank uh, calculations, and are used only in with this purpose. And And uh, naturally, the question remains whether um, it is necessary to, th to come up with some other regulation mode for crypto assets that are at little less than high risk. And this is all that I wanted to tell you. Now we probably should uh, come uh, over to the discussion. I have highlighted the main questions, and now I invite my colleagues to come to the stage. Konstantin Karishenko, Sergei Ivlyev, and Olga Stepanova, uh, who has participated in many summer schools and uh, also <coughs> a specialist in bank risk management. I want to remind you that we started this talk from the attempt to define the scope of uh, regulation. And uh, coming over to this topic, the first question is to Konstantin. It is clearly stipulated uh, about the scope of regulation is that the digital currencies issued by the central banks will not be within this scope. So this is about all cryptocurrencies except the digital currencies issued by central banks. If somebody is interested at the central bank website, uh, you can uh, download a um, research paper on the analysis of prospects of uh, currency, uh, digital currencies issued by central banks. It is open for um, ac your access. You can find it there. Uh, what do you think? I want to speak a little off this uh, serious and academic line. Um, I remembered an old Soviet joke about conversion. Um, as in Ivan Ivanov was working at a factory uh, producing children's toys. And uh, he took home different spare parts of those uh, toys. But when he tried to assemble something, he always uh, got a Kalashnikov machine gun. So if we ask Basel Committee to make a document on the risk assessment of uh, the uh, agriculture, we will get a very similar document because it's not about assets, it's about the bank. If we replace the object, it uh, doesn't change anything. So it seems to me that um, if we try to 
it is difficult for me to say what risks will change if we replace one asset with another. Because then, um, so I want to say which two aspects are inherent to, cri to crypto assets that are not inherent to any other assets. If you look at the way different assets um, used in the market, for example, securities, uh, we know that there is um, the emission that gives you all information you want to know about the security. And then there are regulations of uh, organized or semi-organized market which describe of the way uh, these uh, securities uh, can uh, work in this market. So this is a set of two documents. And in the context of crypto assets, something different arises. There are, uh, There is a kind of a program inherent or an algorithm in these crypto assets. So a crypto asset is a kind of robot. If, a sim if an ordinary asset is a uh, kind of um, thing that it is easy to predict behavior of. But with crypto assets, it's difficult to predict their future behavior and their outcomes. So the main issue that I see is that it is the, some kind of next level of financial um, assets. Um, and uh, the ordinary assets can give you the, the rules of uh, issuing, the rules of um, uh, using. So this is the first thing. And the second thing is connected with the second one, uh, with the first one. Uh, we will hardly ever see such huge exposure to technical environment of the functioning of these assets. The crypto assets come together with a kind of environment called the blockchain. In blockchain, um, looks like an open source product, and you cannot even be sure uh, what this environment is. For example, forks or hidden bugs that they contain. So an asset is not a financial asset itself, but it's uh, some complicated evolution, evolutioning product. If uh, um, it's not a thing which is born and dies in the same way. But with crypto assets, we cannot be sure that what you get at the beginning will be the same at the end. So these are the two sides of the uh, coin. And this is the difficulty why every we cannot, we remember uh, the this uh, parable about uh, blind people trying to describe an elephant and when nobody could actually describe this elephant. So crypto assets look uh, like this elephant uh, which we are trying to describe, like those blind people. So it seems to me that everything that is written by this Basel committee, it's all correct. We cannot argue with that, but it's not about assets. It's about the banks. But if we think that crypto assets by their emergence will do dis disintermediation, then um, if we put uh, crypto assets and banks together, it will be the same as we put water and fire together. You will get vapor. And yesterday I uh, came up with this question. I realized that if we, that, uh, that we, I realized that Basel was trying to measure the unmeasurable. Konstantin, thank you very much for your story with the machine gun, because when I was reading uh, Basel documents, I had a feeling that 
uh, Basel committee has uh, a lot of knowledge about banks, but not too much about crypto assets. And I would like to ask Sergei, probably we don't need to invent a machine gun again and again. Perhaps we can give a reference to another document that describes crypto assets and regulations instead of producing uh, a new document. Perhaps we can use what is already there in the market, like industry star standards or some other regulations that already exist. So what is your opinion? Um, talking about standards, the industry is not as mature as banking. Uh, there are some standards that it exist in the crypto markets, but they concern security, the storage of keys, and uh, safeguarding so that they don't leak, there is no hacking, and so on. So all the risks are described as cyber risks, but in general I can say that I'm happy that Basel is pretty strict about crypto assets, it's right, because assets and Bitcoin in it were an alternative to the banking system, and this is a tool for the people, but not for the banks. And the less banks inter interfere, the better it is. And probably there will be client requests, and for example, in Germany, it is allowed for banks to give custody for cryptocurrencies and there are certain requirements for insurance and for storage that so that banks can reduce their risks and use um, uh, use the currencies and talking about the properties that Basel doesn't understand, the properties of crypto assets, uh, another one is a social phenomenon. So there is a big Bitcoin. Uh, there are also Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin co uh, Gold, etc. They are almost un identical. It's the same code that copied, but to understand the value of uh, the market, liquidity, uh, it's completely different. So Bitcoin is a stable value, has a stable value, liquidity comparable to shares. It has a regulated uh, market exchange uh, under the New York exchange and in Chicago. So it's a ra rather a stable asset, very similar to commodity. And the second aspect is uh, governance, how this asset is governed. And it's important to understand who has the right to make changes to the code, how these changes will impact technology. And the more different governance we have, the more participants and democracy there is, the more this accent, uh, asset will be similar to a commodity. It doesn't have uh, an issuer, it doesn't have credit risks. And if cryptocurrency is not very well developed and has centralized governance and a company that says what everyone has to do, the more it will be similar to security because there will be an issuer. Thank you very much. It's an interesting observation which is hard to uh, push to the bank regulators because uh, a main feature of crypto assets is democracy and uh, the best way to express it is to say that it's a storage of the results of transactions in a distributed ledger so Olga, I would like to ask you, you have a lot of experience in commercial banks and you are responsible for risk management. 
If we suppose that banks don't have any motivation to get involved in large transactions with crypto assets except for at the request of the customer. So if these crypto assets are assets but not a way uh, of uh, payment, so in this case, do you think such criteria will allow to include crypto assets into the existing risk management processes before there are rules and standards and whatever, because the risks may arise much faster than the documents regulating them. I wanted to say to, to share the opinion of uh, my colleagues uh, when I was reading this document, uh, my impression was a memory of Platonian person, because Basel starts the page that there is no definition of crypto asset, and uh, therefore it becomes unclear if we don't know the elephant, because uh, risk management and regulation have to be applied to a certain object. If we cannot describe and understand this object by means of a definition, it's very unclear how to use any type of regulation for it. My second idea was in the middle of the document. It, it uh, came up in the middle of the document. Uh, so you were talking about the sources of exposure and working with crypto assets as a list of risks. And, uh, and I had an impression that there is another relevant joke how a student uh, knew only one question uh, uh, on biology about fleas and uh, so he didn't have ex any experience and he used his very narrow experience to answer all questions of the exam. And I had the same idea that there is not enough experience in the area of uh, uh, crypto assets. And since we don't have any experience or too much experience with crypto assets, we use our previous experience about banks in general for the idea of crypto assets. So coming back to risk management, as a practitioner, I don't have enough knowledge about crypto assets to create or generate a new uh, feature. But I would like Basel to pay more attention I would like Basel to pay more attention uh, to, to one characteristic of crypto assets, that's distribution of the crypto assets. And if we were dealing with an object before, that was very well defined and it was issued by a certain party. So we had a fixed price, more or less, yeah, which uh, is a result of many factors and objects. And I know how to measure this price. But when it comes to crypto assets, they are distributed. And as a result, it belongs to nobody. And even if I can measure this risk, I don't know who to claim for the risk. And I can give a practical example. It's already happening. And uh, it is expressed as a legal risk. The problem recently, we had a trial with Vinik. And uh, what's happening is this, a person 
broke the law of one country. At the same time, he is a citizen of another country. He was arrested in the third country and extradicted to the fourth country. And each of these four countries have their own legislation that contradict each other. And they try to use this legislation for one person. So this is one example of what kind of problems we are going to face. Yeah, it's a very vivid example of how an individual may have complications during uh, some legal problems if uh, there are losses connected with crypto assets. I would like to talk about one or two more questions today. So this is the question, as we said before, when such open documents are written for comments from the public, we think more about the object of the risk rather than the nature of the risk. And based on what was said in this document as the channels of loss distribution or threats for the banks in case of operations with crypto assets. Do you think we have to mention something that is not listed in this document? Is there any other specific nature of the crypto tools that may lead to unexpected combinations of risks? For example, a combination of two banking operations of uh, uh, taking deposits and giving loans together may lead to a higher risk. So I think what we have seen before is the vision of traditional banks and banking operations. Do you think there might be some other banking operations that banks could do with the crypto assets that don't fit into the traditional picture? First of all, I would emphasize two points. The first is that that causes my concern is how to make a balance uh, and uh, how to cancel certain transactions if something went wrong. And is it possible that something goes wrong with the system? Because uh, in bank, it happens a lot. and. Uh, and uh, bank officers uh, feel that they have to make certain amendments to the operations that were recorded previously. And if that's not possible, it looks very suspicious. And another thing connected with uncertainty of the operations so it's not clear whether a transaction has happened or not. And to sum up what I, what I said, it uh, boils down to the risk of uh, attack of the 51%. It's hard to imagine uh, when it comes to traditional assets, but I think when it comes to technological risks, we can see that there are such risks, uh, like forks of Bitcoin. Of course, there is a big marketing and social aspects uh, connected with these assets. But the reason of these forks is in the disagreement of a certain group of developers and users with a certain uh, t technical feature that is inherent to the asset itself. So with the protocol. So we have a protocol, like the rules for transaction. And if we try to change them, uh, we have a discussion or an argument. I can give you an example of uh, a risk that happened in India during issuing of physical money, coins. There was one coin 
So it had an elef elephant on one side and the mint that was producing those coins had some kind of fold, production fold, and this elephant didn't have the nose. And if we imagine a picture of the e elephant without a trunk, uh, it looks a lot like a pig. And uh, uh, issuing a coin with a pig on it uh, resulted in a rebellion. So uh, there was a technological risk in the production and uh, a similar thing may happen with blockchain and an elephant will turn into a pig. And uh, uh, like we had Bitcoin gold and it was uh, not proper quality of the coin, so this uh, uh, technological risk is imminent to the uh, crypto assets. I think that, so to sum up with your previous comment, it's difficult to see crypto assets as a currency that is independent from the uh, conditions of issuance and from the rules of issuance because every crypto asset has a lot of unique features. So it's technological governance and regulation risks. I think these are three aspects that uh, are dominant over all other aspects. Yeah, I would like to draw your attention that nothing is said in this document about a very important property is immutability of the results of transactions. And if the transaction is incorrect, according to two parties, maybe there was fraud and both parties want to cancel the transaction. In the existing systems, that's impossible. Only losses can be compensated by means of a new transaction, but uh, to cancel the old transaction uh, is not possible. And everything listed here is based on the immutability of transactions. And I think this observation should be sent to the authors of this report. So when we talk about finance, it, it comes, so they are final. So the transactions are all really final. Then I have a question to Olga about the same group of questions. We understand that we don't have a lot of experience of transactions, but still, are there any expectations in the industry uh, which may be the main uh, factor of exposure? Will it come from the banks that want to make money on the reducing interest rates, or will it probably be dominated by the client interests? if we talk about investments or speculations. I would like to talk about speculations because uh, in my opinion, banks have, do have interests in crypto assets. Uh, like you said in the beginning of your presentation, already a few years ago, banks were interested and they wrote you a letter uh, about uh, cryptocurrencies. And I think in the near future, the first, first of all, uh, there will be some market transactions with these assets but I think the government uh, now has a lot of influence and uh, has forbidden 
almost forbidden transactions with crypto assets because there is no legal basis for them. And uh, another thing is uh, there is a problem of pricing for crypto assets also should they be included into the bank books and uh, trading books uh, so there are a lot of problems which lead to one another and they slow down the speculative um, process with the crypto assets but probably this will be the most uh, um, uh, attractive thing for the bank and they can get extra marginal profit based on volatility but now it's forbidden and the banks will be moving in the direction of risk operator I think banks will use it as an attempt of certain electronic interaction with the customer in a new technology form and and op risk will be important in this case and uh, and i think that uh, what i didn't like was that basel committee tried to take a tool and only talk about the familiar risk factors or types of risk and i had an impression that they took basel 2 or maybe basel 3 and they in, instead of asset they used crypto asset and they didn't ch change anything but i believe the problem is to describe the elephant and we don't know what kind of elephant we are dealing with and I'm sure that uh, this elephant will lead to new types of risks that we have to take into account and the last question I would like to ask to each of the participants about the elephants there are different types of elephants of different size and I have a feeling that all crypto assets are different and when we try to divide them into two categories, high risk and low risk, uh, I think this is what the authors of this document are trying to do. So I would like to ask your opinion as experts in uh, the markets, maybe Sergei, first of all, Is there any reason why we can divide all the crypto assets into into certain groups uh, that can be regulated as highly risky assets? Or maybe it's more of uh, an imagination and we still need to study this market more and see how assets that are risky today become less risky in the future so is there any uh, distinction so uh, as far as i understand they are trying to divide stable coins that have collaterals or some other way of like stabilizing them but for the high risk assets i think there's a wide spectrum of uh, currencies and assets is there almost all the crypto assets are high risk and there's a huge variety there are tokens platform tokens utility tokens for certain services anonymous coins for settlements so there's a whole wide range of uh, assets and uh, and it depends on the purpose of the asset its governance liquidity uh, the market and pricing So 
Bitcoin can be a kind of anchor and all the other crypto assets. Uh, so Bitcoin can be a kind of uh, uh, basic asset and other uh, risks can be expressed relevant to Bitcoin. And uh, then everything that's on one side is a low risk asset and uh, uh, everything that's on the other side is a high risk asset. And uh, but we know that these threshold effects are rather painful for the participants of the market because some of them think it's unfair. But the other thing is that if we try to we can say that there are stabilized crypto assets and then the criteria that describes them should be used for them specifically but not for all the other assets. I would like to share a different point of view. So we were talking about behavioral approach with Sergei. But I suggest to look from the point of view of monetary theory. So currency was uh, appeared as a means of exchange. So in English it's called uh, monanious. And I think it's a very good indicator of the risk. For example, I would divide crypto assets with the limited and unlimited volume of issuance. If they are limited, they don't need to worry because they have deflation effect and they will never turn into money by definition. Adaptive objects that don't have any limitations of issuance uh, uh, so we know all the inflation stories and kings that had a lot of uh, uh, unsecured uh, securities and uh, at a certain point uh, it was a risk and what's happening today in Japan and US and uh, Europe and uh, so the second um, feature is uh, a quasi-empirical or theoretical target for the volume of this object that provides the demand for this object. So if we issue a coin to pay in any cafe, we have to measure the amount of coffee drunk and we have to compare the amount of coffee with the amount of coins. So, like Friedman said in his the theory. So, I think uh, there is not much to argue about. It's just based on the monetary circulation theory. If we believe that crypto assets are a financial instrument. It's a very interesting comment. The only problem is that for the bank that operates in the market, these things can be unattainable and unmeasurable because it doesn't have the information required to answer this question. So it has to be provided by higher authorities that have macroeconomic information, like the number of cups that people drink every day that can be paid by the cryptocurrency. In this uh, part, what we are facing now and what changes the model drastically is that we are coming to a situation when the differentiation between the financial asset and money is uh, disappearing. And uh, the usage of this asset in a new quality is an issue that needs solution for us to be able to assess the risk in a quant qualitative way. So it, when we pay money for an object, that's one thing. But when both become the same thing, then it changes the picture. The, the commodities um, 
um, accept the functions of money in this case. So the question to Olga now, as to somebody who works in a bank and who wants to f be able to predict uh, high risk before it emerges. Um, can you now see the signs of uh, high risk in those uh, crypto assets? I actually perceive this text in a different way and it seems to me that it is not an attempt of Basel to stipulate that we, among those assets there are those that are more risky than others. It seems to me that among all assets, which I don't think is possible, it's an attempt to say that some of these assets are of, le of uh, lower risk than others. As a risk manager, I don't support this idea because in my view, if we want to treat, uh, to cure a person in a good way, a person with a headache, of course we should uh, diagnose the reason for this headache and uh, one patient will need a pill and another will need an operation. But here, I, uh, we are at the stage of uh, treating a person with a stone, hitting them on the head with a stone. And in this case, we really need the reason for this um, headache. It doesn't matter. If we are the only means that we can use is a stone on the head. I want to say that uh, if the head is a square shape, then you can use a stone on the head uh, treatment. The second thing I want to say is that my teachers told me that when you're doing something, ask yourself why you're doing this. And I want to say that the driver for declaring some assets lower risks than others is the lack of capital. Because um, this is all done for charging capital. And so if we realize that we lack capital, and then maybe we should do that until we face with this situation until the volume of those operations is not that high. Uh, and I don't see any sense in, uh, do, in trying to divide those assets into high risk and lower risk. Uh, thank you very much for this um, weighted uh, capital and saying that uh, until this um, problem is ripe, maybe it doesn't make any sense to uh, to deal with it, but maybe, so I'm uh, suggesting a more conservative approach to all assets, not trying to divide them into better ones and worse ones, treat them all as high risk. Maybe Basil will like this comment. Uh, don't try to divide your sheep into black and white ones and consider all sheep or all swans black ones. Dear colleagues, unfortunately, we're very short of time. I want to thank the participants of this panel for their very interesting comments from all s different spheres. And I think that if we transcribe them and send them to Basel Committee, they will make a valuable contribution. Uh, thank you uh, for to the audience.